Hello everyone, welcome to Reading Culture and our continued study of Shakespeare's Henry V. So when we left off, uh, with Act Two of Henry V, Henry was off for France. The traitors within England had been dealt with. The message had been sent to the King of France that he was coming, like a Jove he's described. Well, come Act Three, he's now in France. And we're going to get, I think, an even better sense of Henry's character and how he's functioning within this text by looking at how the campaign is actually conducted and what it looks like throughout. So let's begin by looking at the prologue of the chorus. So this is how Act 3 begins. Thus with imagined wing our swift scene flies in motion of no less celerity than that of thought. Right, you can transport across the sea in a very blink of an eye. Suppose that you have seen the well-appointed king at Hampton, peer embark his royalty, and his brave fleet with silken streamers the young Phoebus fanning, play with your fancies, and in them behold, upon the hempen tackle ship boys climbing, hear the shrill whistle which doth order give to sounds confused, behold the threatened sails borne with the invisible and creeping wind, draw the huge bottoms through the furrowed sea, breasting the lofty surge. You but think you stand upon the rivage and behold the city on the inconstant billows dancing, for so appears this fleet majestical, holding due course to Harfleur. Follow, follow. In other words, imagine you see this great fleet, right? You can hear the whistles, you can smell the sea, you can see the boys clamoring over the ropes, and ultimately, right, you can see the city on the horizon. Because again, this is all being created on in the mind, on the stage. Grapple your minds to sternage of this navy, and leave your England as dead midnight still, guarded with grandsires, babies, and old women. It's a sense that all the men have left. They've all gone to war. Either passed or not arrived to pith and poisons. For who is he whose chin is but enriched with one appearing hair that will not follow these cold and choice-drawn cavaliers of France? Right? So in other words, every boy, even who has a single hair on his chin, is going to be going off uh, to fight. Work, work your thoughts, and therein see a siege. Behold the ordinance on their carriages, with fatal mouths gaping on girded Harfleur. Suppose the ambassador from the French comes back, tells Harry that the king doth offer him Catherine, his daughter, and with her dowry, some petty and unprofitable dukedoms. The offer likes not, and the nimish gunner with limestock now the devilish cannon touches. Down goes all before them, still be kind, and eke out our performance with your mind. Right, so... Again, he's calling attention to the artificiality of the conventions of the stage. You can't properly represent a siege of a city, right? But he's he's describing it, right? The cannons blasting, the wall is falling. Henry is in full war mode here. So now that the scene has been set, let's see how Henry appears within it. This is scene one. Uh, right, so enter King Henry, Exeter, Bedford, Gloucester, and soldiers with scaling ladders. So they're ready to scale the walls of the city. And Henry gives one of his most famous lines, probably one of Shakespeare's most famous lines. Once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close up the wall with our English dead. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood. Disguise fair nature with hard-favored rage. And lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let it pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow overwhelm it as fearfully as doth a galled rock, or hang and gutted his confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide. Hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. On, on, you noblest English, whose blood is fed from fathers of war-proof, fathers that like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morn till even fought and sheathed their swords for lack of argument. Dishonor not your mothers now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood, and teach them how to war. And you, good yeomen, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not. For there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start, the games afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge, cry God for Harry, England, and St. George. So it's a very rousing speech, in a very rousing way, to begin this first scene of the third act. 
and what we see within it is many of the things that uh, Henry is often kind of doing throughout. So, for instance, he's on the one hand praising modest stillness uh, and humility, but in peace. But he's saying that all well, these are virtues in peace; they're not what we need for war. And war we need to again take on the aspect of a tiger. Um, so we get this kind of bestial image, uh, right? And this this idea that you have to you know summon up the blood, you have to disguise fair nature. And instead, you have to put on hard favored rage, right? So there's a, there's a hardness that is necessary here, right? And lend the eye a terrible aspect, uh, right? These seem like kind of negative characteristics. Um, right? This idea of, you know, setting the teeth and the nostrils stretching wide, right? But then he's going to juxtapose this with talk of nobility, right? He refers to them as the noblest English. Um, he, he compares them to Alexander, who famously, right, in the legend, wept because there are no, there were no more worlds to conquer. So there's this idea that they have to sheathe their swords because there's no argument, as I say, there's no more fight left. They have, right? He he set, you know, calls upon their family, right, to honor your mother and be worthy of your fathers, right? And he particularly addresses the yeomen. So yeomen were a particular class of men in England that were still below the landed gentry, so they weren't actually noble, but they were above peasants, and so they, they owned their own land. Um, and this uh, class of men often furnished the bowmen for the English armies of this period, and indeed, in the actual historical Battle of Agincourt, are really responsible for the victory. Um, but it's worth noting, though, that there's there was a particular pride being taken in them here, right? He even goes so far as to say that uh, uh, right, there's a, there's a noble luster in their eyes, even though they aren't technically noble. There's something noble about them, um, and he compa compares them to greyhounds about to take off. And we get this final line, right? That the game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge, cry God for Harry, England, and Saint George. Right. So it's the three things that are really binding this uh, patriotic kind of thing, and you could maybe even say the play if we want to read it as a patriotic play together. Right. You know, God, King, and Country. These are the things that the men are fighting for. And Henry is very much associating him with both, uh, himself with both. So on the one hand, he's associating himself with God, right? God is on our side. This is a just and noble cause. On the other hand, of course, he's bringing all of England together under him. So these are, uh, in many ways, his, we're getting a sense of what war is like for him, how he wages it, um, and also how he portrays the common soldier. Now, in the next scene, scene two, we get to see some of these common soldiers. Uh, Nim, Bardolph, Pistol, and the Boy. Uh, we also get the introduction of uh, some other characters. We get Flewellen, we get Gower, and we eventually get uh, McMorris and Captain Jamie. And one of the things that, of course, you'll notice is that they all represent different nationalities. So McMorris and Captain Jamie are really, in many ways, almost caricatures, these kind of national stereotypes. McMorris of the Irishman and Captain Jamie of the Scotsman. Uh, we get more developed characters with Gower and particularly Flewellen. So Gower is English and Flewellen is Welsh. Now, one thing that is maybe worth noting is that, uh, of course, this is being written in the late Tudor period and the Tudors uh, claim descent from Welsh royalty as well as English. Um, so you know, maybe that's one of the reasons why the Welsh come out fairly good here. Um, again, you have the kind of caricatures on the Scots and Irish side. And in terms of McMorris and the Irish, he's, he's kind of, uh, not as united, let's say, right? He's actually comes to almost comes to blows with uh, Flewellen. But there's something significant in that in this scene, we see all the nationalities. We see the Irish and the Scots and the Welsh and the English. So remember at the point certainly that uh, these events are taking place and even at the point when this is written, while Eng uh, England is, uh, you know, has by this point already brought Wales into, um, you know, into its governance, Scotland is a separate country. Um, Ireland of, is to varying degrees in both the uh, 15th century when this uh, act, these events take place and in the late 16th more so, right, is in, you know, being partially colonized and is under kind of English hegemony, but it's certainly not integrated um, into England in the way that we will see later. In other words, this is pre-United uh, Kingdom of Great Britain. Um, the Union Jack has not been created yet. Union Jack is the creation, is the fusion of all, well, nearly all the national flags. The flag of St. George of England, of St. Andrew of Scotland, and St. Patrick of Ireland. Now, the reason I bring this up is because there's a sense that, you know, 
as we just had in the previous uh, scene, it's Harry for England. But at the same time, he's seen as a uniting figure, uniting all of the peoples of the British Isles. Uh, right? So there is a sense of a kind of united Great Britain that's under Henry. And this seems to emphasize his power and might and glory, the fact that all of these peoples are all in his army and that they're all, you know, striving for the same goal of overcoming the French, but under his authority. So that's, uh, I think, one of the main things to note in Act 2. If you move on now to Act 3, we're going to get one of the most important speeches for analyzing uh, Henry's character and one of the most shocking, uh, which I will read in full here. So this is scene 3 of Act 3. This is still before the gates of our floor. And the, the governor and some of the citizens are on the walls, the English forces below. And uh, King Henry enters and makes this terrifying speech. How yet resolves the governor of the town. This is the latest parley we will admit. Therefore, to our best mercy, give yourselves. Or, like men proud of destruction, defy us to our worst. For as I am a soldier, a name that in my thoughts becomes me best, if I begin the battery once again, I will not leave the half-achieved hard floor till in her ashes she lies buried. The gates of mercy shall all be shut up, and the flushed soldier, rough and hard of heart, in liberty of bloody hands, shall range with conscience wide as hell, mowing like grass your fresh fair virgins and your flowering infants. What is it then to me if impious war arrayed in flames like to the prince of fiends do with his smirched complexion all fell feats and linked to waste and desolation? What is it to me when you yourselves are caused if your pure maidens fall into the hand of hot enforcing violation? What reign can hold licentious wickedness when down the hill he holds his fierce career? We may as bootless spend our vain command upon the enraged soldiers in their spoil, as send precepts to the Leviathan to come ashore. Therefore, you men of Harfleur, take pity of your town and of your people. Whilst yet my soldiers are in my command, while yet the cool and temperate wind of grace or blows the filthy and contagious clouds of heady murder, spoil, and villainy. If not, why, in a moment, look to see the blind and bloody soldier with foul hand defile the locks of your still shrieking daughters, your fathers taken by the silver beards and their most reverend heads dashed to the walls, your naked infants spitted upon pikes, while the mad mothers with their howls confused do break the clouds as did the wise of Jewry at Herod's bloody hunting slaughtermen. What say you? Will you yield and this avoid, or guilty in defense be thus destroyed? And after such a speech, they have no choice. They respond, Our expectation hath this day an end. The Dauphin, whom of succors we entreated, returns us that his powers are not yet ready to raise so great a siege. Therefore, great king, we yield our town and lives to thy soft mercy. Open our gate, enter our gates, dispose of us and ours, for we no longer are defensible. And Henry responds by saying, Open your gates. Come, Uncle Exeter. Go you and enter Harfleur, there remain and fortify it against this French. Use mercy to them all. For us, dear uncle, the winter coming on and sickness growing upon our soldiers, we will retire to Calais. Tonight in Harfleur, we will be your guest. Tomorrow for the march we are addressed. So it's a very heady speech and there's a lot to unpack here. I mean, if we look at, so what, what is he actually saying here? So first of all, he's saying that this is the last time we ask you, right? This is the last time we will show you mercy. And basically, you will be proud to destruction. And in many ways, it seems he's saying you'll be the cause of it if you don't yield now. And again, defy us to our worst. In other words, if you defy us, you'll see the worst of us. He says, for I'm a soldier, that is right, a name that uh, fits me best. And we again, we see him here at his most warlike, certainly. Right? So he threatens that if he has to resume the siege, right, he will not stop until all of our floor lies in ashes. Right. And again, there's a sense that the gates of mercy will be shut up. Right? Mercy will be gone. And the question is really, again, would they indeed have been shut up if the gates had remained shut against them? We have this, this picture of the flesh soldier, right? It's all of the, all of the bestial, fleshy aspects of man uh, coming out again, rough and hard of heart. Remember, he had talked about, you know, put away these softer things and you, you, you need to take on a harder aspect. Well, here we're seeing it in spades. And then we get the sense of, 
in liberty of bloody hands. So he's just saying he's giving them liberty of bloody hand, or simply that the natural case of war is that they'll have this liberty to do whatever they want once they take the city, with conscience wide as hell. So already, already though, he's associating these actions as being evil, hellish, right? They're conscience wide as hell. So that that's very important. Um, and, but and again, this horrible thing of mowing like grass, fresh fair vir virgins of flowering infants are going to slaughter. Uh, you know, even innocent young women and children, right? And then, and then he continues, right, saying that, like, by asking again, is he sincere in this? What is it to me if impious wars? He's saying that war is impious, says impious, right? It's it's it goes against the pieties of duty and religion, uh, right? Arrayed in frames like the prince of fiends, that's Satan himself. So he's he's comparing this to the work of Satan. Um, do with smirched complexion, right? Besmirched with blood or smoke, what have you, all fell feet and linked to waste and destruction. So he's saying that this destruction right, is wasteful and it's fell, right? There's this there's this doomed aspect to it. But he keeps asking these questions, what is it to me when you yourselves are caused? So again, we've seen this throughout, if saying if you don't yield to me, then the fault is on you. Does that mean that he actually would have allowed this to happen? Because he would have said, Well, it was on their own heads. Right, when you yourselves are the cause of your pure maidens fall into the hands of hot enforcing violation, right? He's saying that is, you know, their own maidens are going to be, uh, uh, you know, abused by these men if this doesn't stop. And he talks, he even talks about the rain, what rain, as the rain is on a horse, right? Can hold licentious wickedness. So again, he's saying, of course, that this is wicked. When down the hills he holds his pure spirit. Basically, there's a sense of you're going. It's like you can't, the reins can't hold in a chariot going downhill. That's kind of what he's saying. And maybe you could argue that what he's saying here is not that he is going to order these things to happen, but simply that it will be out of his control. Once the uh, the siege is started, he can't, just like trying to control a chariot going downhill, he can't control the bloodlust of his men. Right, and he even talks about sending ashore the Leviathan. You may recall in the video that I did with Jonathan Pajot on the... Uh, uh, story of Saint Margaret and the Dragon that we talked a little bit in that uh, discussion about Leviathan, right? It's a it's a creature from uh, the Bible. It's this it's this great you know creature that's in the sea that's uh, right around the edge of the world. That's uh, it, again it's chaos incarnate. So the sense of him on the coming ashore of Leviathan is the coming ashore of all chaos and disorder and slaughter. And then he, right, again, he continues on this sense of, right, you know, take pity on your town and people. So he's not saying that he's going to take pity. It's up to them to take pity by surrendering, right? While, and this is important though, when it, the way he, he phrased it, while he's, yet my soldiers are in my command. So again, it seems like he might be indicating that I can command them now to not commit, commit these crimes, but later it's out of my hands. Right, and while yet the cool and temperate wind of grace or flows the filthy and contagious clouds of heady murder, spoil, and villainy. So he's saying that there'll be murder and spoil and villainy. These bad things will happen. Um, but again, you know, kind of it seems it has control. Again, the blind and bloody soldier with foul. Uh, if not, why in a moment look to see? He's saying this is what's going to happen, right? That their, that their daughters will be violated. Their fathers will be dashed to the ground and even their naked infants will be spitted upon pikes while the shrieking mothers cry out. He's saying, just as the wives of Jewry adheres bloody hunting slaughtermen. This is a reference to the story in the Christian Gospels where Herod is trying to kill this savior that he's heard has been born, which is Jesus Christ. And uh, they, uh, Joseph and Mary, get Jesus out in time before Herod's soldiers come, but he orders all uh, young children to be slaughtered. Now, this is important because he's comparing this horrific crime to Herod, who tried to kill Jesus Christ himself and slaughtered all of the infants in the town of Bethlehem. I mean, there is no more evil act that he could associate this with. So the question is, he's clearly recognizing this as an abhorrence. Is he saying it's an abhorrence that is their fault and which he can't control? Or is he not sincere in this threat? So, and again, in response to this, right, he sums it all up saying, like, will you yield and avoid this from your power? Or guilty in defense, the guilt is on you for continuing the defense. Be thus destroyed, right? Is this is this a true shifting of the guilt that he's trying to uh, do here? And they surrender, and then he makes this very important line: "Use mercy 
to them all. In many ways, how we see Henry hinges entirely on how we interpret this scene. And how we interpret it if we were, to, we were to be watching this on the stage might have to do with the way it was produced, that it directed, uh, how it was acted by the main character, uh, the actor. Reading it, of course, we have really two main options. Uh, so it's clear that he at least is trying in the speech to shift the blame to the people, right, either way. So, and clearly he recognizes these things as moral evils. So there's just a question of whether or not he takes responsibility for them. So the question is, is he sincere? If they had not surrendered, uh, by surrendering, did they only save him the trouble of doing what he says he's going to do? Or would he indeed have done it? Would he have raised the city to the ground? Would the soldiers have been allowed to go in and commit these atrocities? If so, it seems that Shakespeare is in fact not presenting Henry as a hero in this text. He's actually subverting what is a traditionally heroic English king by presenting him in this fashion. But there is another option. And the other option is that he is not sincere. That the true Henry, the sincere Henry, is the one who says, use mercy to them. Right? Again, the other argument could say, well, he says, use mercy because they surrendered. If they had not surrendered, they would have suffered these atrocities. But the other way to read it is to say, well, he was using an empty idle threat, right? He never would have actually allowed those kinds of atrocities to happen. He was simply trying to scare them into surrendering, and that the real Henry is a Henry who says, use mercy to them all. If you read it the one way, you can still see Shakespeare as presenting him in this heroic, albeit problematic and troubling way still, but you can still see him as a heroic character. But if Shakespeare means that he would have done these things, then it does not seem that we can read it in that way. Now, on the basis of this speech alone, those both seem like at least partially valid options. He may have a leaning one way or another. We can test our hypothesis whether he actually would have allowed these atrocities to happen or whether he would not, and it was an idle threat, by looking at his speech and action later in the play. So let's continue reading. Uh, so in the next in the next scene, scene four, we get a scene mostly in French uh, between Catherine, who we already know has been promised to Henry, um, although he doesn't accept the uh, first offer, uh, who's trying to learn some words in English. His body part, torture, lady in waiting. And it's, it's very humorous. It's actually a scene probably originating from a farce, a French farce. And there's this sense of juxtaposition, which you often get in Shakespeare, which is a very heady, high drama, right, in this previous scene with then, you know, kind of low comedy. Um, but keep, note this scene because it's our introduction to the character of Catherine, and she will be very significant later on in the play. Uh, then we get scene five. Now, scene five is significant insofar as we see that by this point now, apparently the English are not doing very well. Uh, and indeed, it ends with them saying that they're going to actually ask what ransom uh, he, Henry will take, because it seems that he's kind of done, uh, right? So the French king says about line 60, said, Lord Constable, haste on, Mountjoy, and let him say to England that we send to know what willing ransom he will give. Prince Dauphin, you shall stay with us in Rune. Uh, right? And he asked him to be patient, for you shall remain with us. Now forth, Lord Constable and princes all, and quickly bring us word of England's fall. So it seems that England is about to fall. They're, they've overstretched themselves, and uh, the French are so confident that they're even asking what. Uh, so the idea is Henry will surrender himself, a huge ransom, a king's ransom, quite literally, will have to be paid to get him back, and uh, his war will be over. In scene six, we get a significant scene uh, between Fluellen and Pistol. Pistol is saying that Bardolph, right, you remember from uh, earlier in the play, he has been guilty of stealing a pax, uh, which is actually probably it was meant here as a pix, which is a vessel for holding the uh the bread from uh the catholic eucharist the communion bread um it's uh usually kept in a, in a sacred vessel that's gold and it's death to pillage a church and bartle has done this is now sentenced to hang pistol as asking fluellen to uh, uh try and get the king to commute the charge fluellen says if you were my own kin i wouldn't i would say that he should hang for this crime and he relates that Bardolph, remember, Bardolph was a friend along with Falstaff of Hal when he was Prince Hal, that he would go out, you know, carousing with and getting up to no good with an old friend. And yet when informed that he has been sentenced to hang for this crime, 
Henry responds in this way. He says, we would have, this is, uh, this is scene um, six, line, uh, about line 115. We would have all such offenders so cut off, and we would give express charge that in our marches through the country, there'd be nothing compelled from the villages, nothing taken but paid for, none of the French upbraided or abused in disdainful language, for when lenity and cruelty play for a kingdom, the gentler gamester is the soonest winner. This is a hugely important line. Uh, so first and foremost, we get right off the bat a question of, of what kind of a man is this that would say that we would have all such offenders cut off? This is his friend that he spent all this time with, and he's saying that he's not going to try and save him. But we see, we've seen this throughout, the sense of the king as just, that he will not, out of personal regard, uh, interfere in justice. So the idea is that this is a crime uh, that, under the law, requires death, so he will see it executed. And he then makes it clear that it's not out of wanton cruelty, but out of justice by this right following saying that they shouldn't steal or force anything from the French villagers, that anything they take should be paid for. And he even says, do not upbraid the French in disdainful language. He doesn't even want them to just speak uh, to them disrespectfully. Uh, and then he says this great line of when lenity and cruelty play for a kingdom, the gentler games are the serious winners. This doesn't seem consistent with what he did before. Again, two ways of interpretation. One would be to say that, well, now that he's losing, he thinks, well, we better stay on the good side of the French, even though he would have committed these atrocities. The other way to interpret it is to say that that was an idle threat before. He was always going to use mercy to them. He never would have allowed those atrocities to happen. He just was trying to scare them. And that this Henry, the one who doesn't want them stolen, anything stolen from them, doesn't even want them abraded in bad language, that is the actual Henry, the Henry of justice. He will have his friend hanged on the gallows, but not a single thing will be stolen from the French under his command. So again, what kind of a man is this of so many different aspects? We then get the entrance of the ambassador, who in somewhat disdainful language, calls him to surrender. And we see Henry's response saying that he does his office fairly. Turn thee back. He says, this is around 150. And tell thy king I do not seek him now, but willing, but could be willing to march on to Calais without impeachment, for to say the sooth, tis no wisdom to confess so much unto an enemy of craft and vantage. My people are with sickness much enfeebled. My numbers lessened, and those few I have almost no better than so many French. Who, when they were in health, I tell thee, Harold, I thought upon one pair of English legs did march three Frenchmen. So basically, you know, uh, every Englishman was worth three Frenchmen, but now that they're sick, it's about one to one. Um, so he goes on telling them about, you know, that they're in really bad state and that they're actually not looking for a fight. And that, but if they do want to fight, he says, we shall your tawny ground with your red blood discolor. This is about line 170. And so Montjoy, fare you well. The sum of all our answer is but this. We would not seek a battle as we are, nor as we are, we say we will not shun it. So tell your master. He says he will deliver it, and then he ends that we are in God's hands, brother, not in theirs. March to the bridge, it now draws toward night. Beyond the river, we'll encamp ourselves, and on tomorrow, bid them march away. So he says, we're not ready, we're not prepared to fight, but we will do so. You know, there seems to be this kind of respect, perhaps, in Montjoy, the sense that he comes in this haughty message saying surrender, and Henry admits, we're sick, we're not prepared to fight, and we're willing to march on without one, but we will fight you if we need be. And so we, we get a sense of what kind of a man Henry is when his back's against the wall. As in juxtaposition to the final scene, scene seven of the act, where we get a very humorous scene where the Dauphin is talking about how great his horse is and how many English he will kill. And the scene ends with uh, the Duke of Orleans saying, it is now two o'clock, but let me see, by 10, we shall each have a hundred Englishmen, right? So we see the haughty nature of the French in comparison, in comparison to the humility that Henry has just shown. Uh, now he's perhaps humbled because, again, he's lost. And, and throughout all of these questions, there's a question of, is the virtue of Hal, of Henry, simply a matter of necessity? He shows mercy when it's convenient because they've surrendered. He uses gentleness when it's necessary that the people be on his side, right? He is humble when he's 
army is weak. Um, is this simply a matter of necessity, or is it his real character? Well, perhaps we'll know more when we look in the next video at Act 4. We see him once more thrown into the hazard.